language fellow. Um, so uh, welcome everyone to my last webinar at, officially as an English language fellow. I've been teaching at the University of Opole this year, and I do teacher training through the consulate in Krakow, uh, the embassy in Warsaw, the uh, regional English language office in Estonia, and I get to work with great uh, organizations like IATEFL Poland. So today we're going to be talking about um, how you can submit your writing or your students' writing. We're going to be talking about uh, what to do if you want to create more writing, how to find a writing community. And I hope too that throughout you can just use the chat at any time, share a comment you have or an idea. Um, we're going to be talking about literary journals. So I mostly am focusing on the states because that's where I am and I know a lot of the uh, American journals. So if you know journals in other countries that are looking for uh, writing in English or translations into English, please share them. Um, it's really important, I think, that we all share our resources. Um, so at the end, if you have uh, any more comments to make or questions about the process, hopefully I can answer those for you. I should say I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm someone who has spent a couple of years submitting some short stories to different journals, and I got to know a bit about the process. And from working with some of my students who are amazing writers, but they're quite um, shy about their writing abilities or they're afraid that an English language journal wouldn't want their work. I wanted to give this webinar to reassure people that there are plenty of journals, wonderful journals out there that are looking for um, writing from people from other countries, writing in translation, and they would love, many journals would love to say, this is a story from someone in Turkey, or this is a story from someone in Poland, or this is a story from, uh, from someone who's published their first piece of writing in English. So please don't be discouraged um, or don't think that you can't find a place where you can submit your writing. Okay. So as I mentioned, um, this, we're gonna talk about what you can do to submit your writing. So the first part of this presentation is going to be about um, the scenario in which you or your students already have some writing completed. So the first part isn't about the writing itself, it's about what to do with the writing. So maybe you're a writer, maybe you've written some poetry, nonfiction, fiction, maybe you write book reviews, maybe you've done translations and or maybe you've taught students who done translations and you've found some of them just absolutely amazing and you think all oh, these need to be published or you have students that like to do creative writing and they've asked you what they can do with their writing. So it's really great to be able to provide our students with some uh, ideas for where they can have an authentic audience for their writing. It's so much more exciting for them if they think, oh, someone you know, might be reading my writing in an online journal or people around the world might get to read what I wrote or might get to read one of my national poets or writers translate into English for the first time. So I think it's really exciting. It's, it's a really cool process. Um, I'm gonna, I'm just before I forget, in the chat, I want to, if I can, paste some links because I realized that I don't think in this presentation I included a lot of links from translation. So these are some links that I just posted that are, that are journals that accept translation and or sites that you can go to that have lists of journals that accept translation. Because I'm going to be talking about fiction, nonfiction, poetry. Some journals want translation, some don't. So th this is, these are some more resources where you can find um, some, trans some journals that would like translations. Okay, so the first step, if you've written something or your students have written some things and you all think it's wonderful, okay, and it probably is, uh, the first thing is just to make sure you never ever submit something if you've been the only reader. You wanna make sure if you've written something that you've had you know, at least one other pair of eyes on it, if your students written something that they have, they have someone else to look at it also, because there's that, you know, that there's that, um, you know, sometimes when we write something, we think, oh, it's terrible and we're quite perfectionistic, but there are times when we write something and in that blush of, you know, post-creation blush, we think, oh, this is amazing. This is so wonderful. Anyone would love to publish this. And sometimes we're right. And sometimes we really need someone else to look at it and point out, you know, maybe some things that we missed or, or some grammar errors or spelling errors, etc. So first thing is always make sure there's been a reader for everything that you're going to submit. Second thing is, um, 
And, and ways that you could do that is you could have um, exchange your writing with another writer, tell, have your students exchange with another writer, or you could join a workshop and have um, something more formal where people are sitting around telling you what to work on in your writing, uh, how you could improve it. And that can be, that can take a little more time than just having someone else read over your writing and give you some quick comments. So if you give your writing to a reader um, and you, you're wondering, well, what questions should I ask? Because if you just give your piece, your poem, your translation, whatever, to someone else, um, you know, they might give you more feedback than you wanted. They might not say anything really specific. So it's really important that you give them questions. So if you're writing nonfiction, you could ask them, you know, is this interesting? Did you find this topic really interesting? Um, if anything that you're writing, you can ask about discrepancies. Uh, maybe you've forgotten someone's to write someone's name. Maybe you've introduced a character that no one knows who you're talking about. And of course, you can always ask if they would look at your look for grammatical spelling, punctuation, or capitalization errors. I will say though that you know it's really important who you or your students give your writing to, uh, especially if you haven't tried to submit anything before, because. You know, someone might discourage you from writing, someone might be a little harsh. So just, you know, carefully consider who you choose as a reader. And um, I have a suggestion here for a link about 15 questions that you can send to your readers to ask about your writing. So I have a, a source slide at the end of the presentation. Um, sometimes I'll just send something to someone and say, does it make sense? Is there anything that is confusing to you? Because I write fiction. Um, if you're writing poetry, you might want to ask someone if there are any, you know, certain words or lines that really stood out to them, if they felt there were any cliches, uh, if there were any expressions that they didn't like, etc. So just make sure that when you send your writing along to someone, you have some questions so you know what kind of feedback that you're looking for. Uh, after you get the feedback, um, you're going to, of course, revise your writing again based on that feedback. And then at that point, you can really do a careful check again for spelling, grammar errors, et cetera, or ask someone to edit your work. Usually paying someone, usually asking someone to look at word level errors, like specific spelling, grammar errors, et cetera, often can be expensive. So if you have a partner you can exchange it with or pair your students up um, with another partner, that can work. Um, I don't write fiction in Spanish, but when I do write something in Spanish that I want to check, I have a Spanish language partner and I will send her something and ask her to check it for grammar uh, and she'll do the same with me in English. So uh, it's really nice to encourage your students to have that sort of relationship with, a, a, you know, someone that also speaks their target language. Okay. So this, I think the next part, um, although like writing of course is difficult and writing takes a lot of courage and a lot of creativity and a lot of time. Uh, one of the things that you'll learn um, if you haven't already is that when you send your writing out to be published in literary journals, the process of finding journals to submit to, preparing your work for the submission and waiting to hear back is such a long process. So um, not to discourage you, there are some journals that have really quick turnaround times. Sometimes you'll hear back immediately, but a lot of journals, it will take quite a while to, for you to hear back from them. And also just kind of determining which journals would like your writing. Um, so it's really important that you recognize, are you writing something that is, uh, is it creative nonfiction? Is it fiction? Is it experimental? What kind of thing are you writing and what kind of journals um, want that kind of writing? Um, because I wanted to point out too that a lot of these journals that aren't the real big famous journals that pay a lot of money um, typically are run by editors that are volunteering their time and or the readers are volunteering their time. So they have, they're reading so many stories, so many translations, so many poems, etc. And you want to make sure that you send them your very best work and that if you have your students, say for an assignment, if you get all your students to submit all their writing to a journal or you ask that every student has to submit one piece to a journal, make sure that the students are really submitting their best work because that is taking up time of these often unpaid editors and, and readers who you know, are doing all this reading in good faith and the students are the ones sending their best work. Okay, sounds like someone might have their microphone on and actually let this is a good time for me to check the chat to see if anybody else has if anyone's posted any questions or anything 
So everybody, please mute yourself, please. Okay. So how do you find journals that you want to submit to? How do you even know which uh, English language journals you're looking for writing? Okay, so there are so many ways that you can find out. And as I said, this is the really time consuming part because it can be really heartbreaking when you're writing to journals and then later realize, what was they doing? They didn't even want my kind of writing. They're doing like science fiction or something completely different than what I'm doing. Um, let's see. I don't know, Lucy, is there you can mute people's microphones? I have just muted everyone, but I don't know if I have uh, it, it, how it works because maybe I muted you. Say no, you did. You did, but that's okay. Now I'm unmuted. Thank you. That's perfect. Okay. So uh, one of the websites that I found is by the writer Erica Krauss, and she went through this really long process of listing journals and and ranking them. So she has uh, journals listed from tier one to tier seven. Now this list is for fiction um, and that can include translations or that can include fiction written in first language. Um, but this list is based on a lot of, she looked at different contests, she looked at different awards, et cetera. So just keep in mind that whenever you look at a ranked list of literary journals, there's really no completely objective list because it depends on, are you looking for journals that pay the most money? Are you looking for journals that are the most famous? Are you looking for journals that want new writers? Are you looking for journals that are looking for international writers, et cetera? There are many different things to look at. So for example, for Erica's um, ranked list, she has for the, the top three listed in the States, the New Yorker, Harper's, and the Atlantic. And she described these as career makers. So um, if you would get something published in one of these publications, you probably would um, you know, get offers to write more things. Uh, I know sometimes if someone gets a story in the New Yorker, then they might get like a book deal. So um, these are you know, really, really prestigious journals and you can win prizes, et cetera, and they pay you professionally. So. The advice that I was given and which I ignored, but a lot of people follow it because it is good advice, is you should do this research and find out a few of your dream journals. So let's say you've written, you've written um, three poems or three translations or three stories. You find which, which are your dream journals, where you would love to be published, and you send your work to those journals, and then you wait. And if those dream journals reject your work, then you go to your next your next highest list of your other dream journals and submit your stories to those journals. So if you follow that process, that means that your work will get published, you know, eventually by the your the highest journals that you're that you're aiming for. Um, but if you're someone like me, who <laughs> when I started out, I I really didn't have the patience to wait to hear back maybe three months, six months, a year from some of these big name journals. I wanted to find out right away, you know, is my writing publishable? Is, is just, do other people think that my writing is good? Can I get some things published online? So I just went online and found a bunch of journals I liked and I didn't really rank them. I was kind of looking for ones that had a shorter turnaround time. Some will promise to get back to you in a few days, in a week, in a few weeks. And that's a lot easier when you're starting out than having to wait for months. Um, and that's, I started to get published that way. And that's, so that it depends on, you know, how patient you are. Um, and of course it helps if you have a lot of writing that you can send out, because maybe you can wait six months to hear back from a really big name journal. But meanwhile, you've sent out a few other pieces to other journals that have a faster turnaround time. So you're getting that feedback. Let me see, I think there are a few chat comments. Um, so Francesca, what do you mean? about the article being a little confused. Um, okay, so anyway, maybe you're talking about this, the these screenshots. So in this screenshot, I have uh, some of the tier one and then some of the tier four. So she has tier one through seven. This is just a little excerpt. I have the link for Erica's website at the end of this webinar. 
Um, so if you look down at tier four, she has a list of, you know, these are some journals that are, they're highly respected, they're small circulation, there's often payment, okay? So she kind of lists some of the um, criteria for different tiers. So you can check that out if you're interested in her idea of what the best journals are. Another one is Clifford, I'm trying to move things out of the way so I can see, it, Clifford Garstang, who has literary magazine rankings from 2021, and he has rankings for fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. So if you go to any of those links, depending on what you're interested in, and again, I have the link to his website at the end, um, you can see what his ideas are for the highest ranked journals. Now, for, for his website, he said he looks at Pushcart Prize winners. So Pushcart Prize are these literary journals that are American. So if he's basing his ranking on journals that have a lot of push push cart prize winners, obviously that's going to favor American journals over foreign journals. So just keep that in mind. I'm more familiar with the American ones. That doesn't mean that there aren't other amazing international journals that would be more highly ranked. It just depends on the criteria. Okay, one second. So for example, he, for, in his nonfiction list, he ranked The Sun as first, and if you go down to four, he has Granta as number four. Granta is, I believe, London-based. So it's not, they're not all American journals, um, but most of them are. Um, and if you look at his poetry list, he has a few different ones, um, but you can see some of these same names again and again, like in Erica's um, listing, like Paris Review is often at the top of list um, for, for, liter for um, literary journals. And if you're looking for UK specific or, um, cause I think they tend to focus more on European writers and European journals, Neon Books has a list of um, UK literary magazines in alphabetical order and they have tons of them. You can see here a sample A3 review um, and they have the link to the website if you wanna check out that journal and it tells you what's the format. So is it a print journal or is it an, an online or electronic journal or is it both? Uh, how often do they publish it twice a year? What kind of formats do they do? So they would take flash fiction, which is really short fiction or poetry. It's literary and they pay. Um, they charge a fee, but they also pay you and you can't send them any reprints. So you have to send them original work. So they have, this is a list if you're looking for more UK focused uh, literary journals. Now, most of what I'm talking about today, because I'm focusing on you, if you're um, publishing things and or your students that are university students, adult students, et cetera, just because you know, most literary journals are for adults. However, Submittable has um, a, a list of opportunities for young writers in 2020. And I didn't see if they've updated it um, yet, um, but they have a whole list of all these different journals that young writers can send their work to. So this would be a good resource if you have you know, secondary students and you'd like them to send work to journals because obviously you wouldn't want them to be sending them uh, work to journals that are just for adults or not suitable for children. So for example, um, I wanted to add this too because I was thinking that obviously I would hope that anyone attending this webinar is interested in literary journal publication, but I know sometimes people just attend because you know it's for English teachers. Um, so I wanted to say even if you're not interested in literary journal publication and or you don't have any students that you know of that are really interested I think it's really fantastic to check out these rankings and these lists and these websites with all of these uh, literary journals that are listed because it gives you so many fantastic reading materials just, just for yourself um, and also for your students like new websites to recommend to your students uh, like Orion magazine on the right. I chose a few articles from that magazine on the environment to assign to my students. Um, so as you can see, a lot of these literary journals, especially the ones that accept nonfiction, have all sorts of categories of really current, recent cultural articles that we can share with our students. So I'm, Salma Gundi is one I'm not familiar with. I just looked it up now, but it looks really fantastic. They have reviews, criticism, uh, essays, fiction, poetry, et cetera. So a lot of different things that you can find there to either assign to your students, read yourself, or you could submit your work there. Um, also, Orion, as I mentioned, they do a lot of environmental writing, but they also have things about, you know, justice, uh, food and agriculture, education, etc. So it's another really fantastic um, source of authentic language to use in your classroom. Okay, let me 
Hello, everybody. I see a few new people have just joined. Welcome. Okay. Um, okay, so one thing is that you can do all this work and find all these amazing journals that you want to see your work in, but the, the really hard part can be that you have to keep track of when they're open. So you might spend hours and hours compiling this list of all these journals that you love and you want to submit to and you get your work ready and then you realize, oh, they're not accepting any work until, you know, next year or until the, the winter or whatever. Um, and so, you know, you have to make sure you keep a spreadsheet or keep some, have some way of keeping track of those things, or you can um, use a, a, like an online database. So one example is Duotrope. Duotrope, you can do, you can use Duotrope for free uh, in a limited fashion, but if you'd like to be able to access everything, you have to pay, I think it's maybe uh, $5 US a month. Um, but in this database, they have tons of literary journals. You can search for the literary journals. You can see if they're open now. You can keep track of everywhere you've submitted. So if you're submitting your work, you can keep track of it in your Duotrope account. Um, and there's just so much that you can see on here to kind of help you with the process of submitting and knowing what to expect. So I wanted to point out. So if, for example, you go into Duotrope and you look up like translation journals, and here's one, Exchanges Journal of Literary Translation. And it gives you a very brief little description of the journal. And then, um, let's see. And it has the note that this, this is a journal of translation. Duotrope isn't primarily for translation. But they give you information. It's a US journal. When was it established? They're not uh, for fiction and poetry. Um, they're not on duotrope. DNQ means does not qualify for whatever reason. But for fiction and visual art, they're open now. And then on the right, you can see it has a picture of the journal and then you can, uh, there's a link to go to the publication's website. So you can find this just by doing a search on duotrope for translation journals, et cetera. And they all, they, you know, they come up with the information. And that way you can see immediately if it's open or not. On the right is Granta, which I mentioned before from the UK. Um, this is one of the big name journals and it gives you some more information right now it's not accepting fiction nonfiction poetry but it says it will open september 1st so duotrope just gives you lots of information about different journals um another thing that it does and i don't know if you can do this with the free version is you can search for anything you're looking for so for example you uh you want to publish some fiction you can do use the search engine and it's actually a lot larger than this but i didn't fit everything on the screen you can type in the genre you write, what kind of style, the topic, the length, what kind of payment you're looking for. Um, are, do you want to submit online? Do you want to submit, you know, by mail, et cetera? Uh, and I also included some nonfiction categories on the side. So for the nonfiction categories, you can, um, you know, you can submit, you can look for reviews, essays, articles, book excerpts, like whatever it is that you've written. Um, and you can look up, they, they also do have some academic, um, you know, journals that they list. So if you want to do academic writing or literary or satirical, et cetera, you can look that up and then Duotrope will give you a list of journals that are, that, that fit that criteria. Um, another thing that is really great about Duotrope is this, this, um, <laughs> this feature it has, which can really ease your mind when you've submitted work. So let's say you've sent some pieces out and it's been, I don't know, a month, two months, you've heard nothing back. And typically you don't wanna contact a journal um, unless they have said they say on their website, like wait two months and then let us know if you haven't heard from us or please don't contact us until six months have, have passed, whatever. So you wanna make sure you follow those guidelines so you don't stress out the editors or the readers. Um, so for example, this journal, Atlas and Alice um, has some information about on Duotrope about who submitted the writing and how long did it take to hear back. So for example, um, it looks like 42.5 is the mean average for how many days it took to hear back from Atlas and Alice. So if you've sent a story to them and it's been 32 days, then you realize, okay, I, you know, I, I'm, it's a little early yet. I probably won't hear for at least another 10 days. Um, someone actually had to wait 232 days um, you know, but that's, that seems to be an outlier. So you can kind of, you can look at this to see how much time you have to wait to hear back from these journals. You typically will not find any of this information on the journal websites. Uh, and responses means how many people who sent something in got a response. Because sometimes journals, 
go defunct. Sometimes journals, you know, have a lot of backlog and actually don't get back to people. I think the New Yorker says, um, if you know, if you don't hear from us in two months, it's a rejection. So some journals won't get back to you if they've rejected you. They'll just give you a timeline so you know whether you should still be waiting or not. So this journal responds to almost 92% and they accept a little more than 10% of the submissions. So you can look those kind of statistics up too to see, do I wanna to submit to journals that have a really low acceptance rate or a really high acceptance rate to start? And also when you get things accepted, then you can kind of compare and realize you know, about what the acceptance rate is. Now keep in mind, all of this information comes from everybody using Duotrope who is plugging in their information, they're sharing who they submitted to, how long it took to get a response back, et cetera. So obviously um, not everyone does that. Not everyone includes their information. Um, so it's not 100% accurate, but it's quite helpful. Sorry. And now if you don't wanna spend money on Duotrope, there's a free online uh, submission grinder and again, I'll share the link at the end. And under the grinder, you can find some similar information. Like it will show you things like, um, so let's say today's March 25th. You can look on there for recent activity and you can see that someone received a rejection from Emerge Literary Journal Fiction and it took one day to get a rejection. So if you're starting out for the first time, sending out your writing for the first time and you don't wanna wait a long time, and you see this, you might think, oh, okay, Emerge Literary Journal is a journal that might let me know within a day if they don't want my writing. So you can look up that journal, you know, click the link and see if it's the kind of journal that you'd like to publish your work. Uh, you know, there are many different ways to go about finding journals. Like obviously the ideal is you only send your work to the journals that are your absolute dream journals, you know, but sometimes, you know, there, there are times that you just wanna see if, if you can get your work accepted on a small online journal and that's totally fine too. Not everybody has that like, you know, Paris review or bust kind of attitude about writing. So, and that's totally fine. Let me see another chat comment. Okay. All right. And then if you look on the left for the Bennington review for fiction, and they also accept poetry, it has a little description. So it says, for example, uh, Bennington Review aims to stake out a distinctive space for innovative, intelligent, and moving fiction, creative nonfiction, poetry, film writing, and cross genre work. So that description right there should tell you if you're writing something that isn't very conventional, maybe more mainstream writing, Bennington Review might not be a good choice for you. They want something a little more experimental. So that's helpful to know. And then it will tell you um, when they are open for submission, they give you information about if they pay, what lengths of stories they're, they're looking for, et cetera. And also, unlike Duotrope, um, the, the free submission grinder also includes, as, I, as far as I know, Duotrope doesn't include this, uh, but this free uh, submission grinder has these charts also. If you're more of a chart person, I'm personally not a chart person, but if you like to kind of see visually information about submission, response, timelines, and things like that, they also have that for each of their journals. And as you can see on the left, if you're searching for fiction markets, for example, they have a bunch of different categories. Are you writing for children, fantasy, horror, et cetera? So you can choose um, which one is more like your work. And that, I would say these, um, you know, duotrope, submission grinder, these sorts of things really cut, off, cut down on time looking for places to send your work because you can plug in like, I've written a 3000 word story. It's literary fiction. Um, I, I want to, it's to submit it electronically, et cetera. And then it will, you will be given a list of the places that are now accepting that work. Okay. All right. So after you found some journals that you love and you've decided you want to be, you'd want to be published there, they're fantastic. Um, if you aren't already, you want to become really familiar with the journal because sometimes you might fall in love with the journal just because of the name or because it's on the top of the list or top of several lists but you really wanna make sure it's a good fit for your writing. Um, sometimes getting published by a journal can mean that you become part of that literary community. You might have an editor that after publishing you is, is a true fan and advocate for you and they post your work on social media and they, they are there to congratulate and retweet when you get your you know, other things published, et cetera. Um, you can sometimes have events where you get to meet other people who published in that journal. So it can be a really, you can become part of that literary community by being published in certain journals. 
Um, so make sure that you read the journal, you know the journal, you know what like what kind of uh, work they're looking for, what kind of aesthetic it has. Um, and make sure that you look for the submission guidelines. So the submission guidelines will tell you all the information about, um, do I need to change the font of my story? Um, should it be, you know, should I have my name in the document or, or no name, no identifying information? Do I need page numbers, et cetera? Uh, and then for the, and also of course, if you need to pay to submit, which I recommend as much as possible, don't ever pay to submit. And then the masthead, which is would have information about the editor, um, the readers, the history of the journal, et cetera. And ideally, when you submit your work, you want to find out who is the editor, who, what's the name of the person I'm sending this to, or the name of the people. Um, so it just looks more professional to say, dear, you know, Emily Smith, instead of, you know, just dear editors, because sometimes you can't find that information. Um, and also you can find out more about the, like, as I mentioned, the history of the journal. And also what about the rights? Do you get the rights? Do you maintain the rights to your writing or do they, does the journal take your rights? Um, how does that work? Is it different for online or print publication? And also awards, is it a kind of journal that will submit your writing to, to be entered in some sort of award uh, contest or not? So the, all of those things can be really important. Okay, so I want to give you an example of a, a website. Let's say that um, let's say that you've heard that Smoke Long Quarterly is a fantastic journal for publishing short fiction, microfiction, and it is. And you're and you're writing short stories. You're writing fiction that's under like a thousand words. So you look and you and you think, okay, I definitely want to submit to Smoke Long Quarterly. But then you but you need to find out more information about the journal, right? So you read some stories. You love it. You love the journal. And then you go to the submission guidelines and then you, you check things like, you know, tells you smoke long only once flash up to 1000 words. They don't take poetry, but they also could take essays on craft or teaching flash um, and that you should include this bio with your cover letter. So, you know, your bio usually is a third person bio. So, uh, you know, I would say something like Willow Barnowski lives in San Jose, California, et cetera. Right. And, and I would include my bio. Uh, I would say I didn't have I did not include sample bios in this uh, presentation because there's so much I wanted to cover. Um, but I would say that check out the other author bios on the site. So you know, find one of the other stories on Smoke Long Quarterly, read a few more, and see what their bios look like because it can really vary. Some journals have very serious bios; they just say like where the writer lives and their previous publications. Others will say things like you know. Um, you know, Mike loves pizza and his pet hedgehog, you know, so you kind of want to see what the what the standard is on that journal in terms of what sort of bio they're looking for. Um, also, and for example, as I mentioned, Smoke Long Quarterly doesn't want you to put your name or anything in the file. They want to read the submissions without knowing who has submitted. Um, and then for the rights, it gives you a little information, for example, about the rights. So if they publish your work, they have rights, electronic rights for three months, et cetera. Uh, it, print rights are a little bit different. So just make sure you read over that, you can look up some information online about rights and what kind of rights that you would like. And then um, another thing is with it, I think because there are so many journals out there, it's really important for me at least that the journal that I submit to or the journals that I like or ones that I, I I think that they're really special and they have a sort of um, maybe similar similar um, beliefs maybe um, in, in like what kind of world we wanna live in or what kind of literary world, whatever. So Smoke Long Quarterly had something on its banner that's mentioned um, a certain camp. And when I looked it up, they're actually, this journal is providing free creative writing workshops for women who have fled war and persecution in their home countries from Afghanistan, Yemen, Iran, and Eritrea. And actually I said free, I don't know if it's free, but I'm assuming it's free. So I just think that's really fantastic. This is a, a well-known journal. The fact that they're using their resources to provide writing classes for people who have fled conflict, I think that's really cool. So that would make me more likely to, you know, submit to a place like Smoke Long Quarterly. You don't need to know that when you submit, but it's nice to know that. Okay. Another thing that you, I really recommend that you use and that you um, sign up for immediately is get a free um, account on Submittable. And Submittable is a kind of a, a website where, that a lot of journals use for submitting their work. So many journals 
they, they won't allow you to email them directly with their work. They don't have their own online portal submission system. You have to sign up for submittable and on submittable, you find their uh, account and you submit that way. And submittable is really nice too, because that way you automatically get to see on that website, has the journal received my story? Is the, is the journal reading it now? I mean, there's some controversy over what the in progress button really means, but, and then if you get rejected or accepted, everything, all of that is kept track of and submittable. You don't have to do anything. So, you know, beyond submitting your piece. So it's really nice. Um, the thing is that it does often or it does often charge a fee for when you submit your, your writing. So for example, I looked up some translation opportunities for, with no fee because often you have to pay $3 to submit your work, it's it's a way of having allowing the journals to pay for their submittable account, but you can find free things. So if you look at this one, um, there's a no fee um, submission for translations to Denver Quarterly, which is a very well known journal, and you can click on the um, the journal names, and you'll have there's a lot more information about the journal. So in addition to the journal's website, when you go to submittable, you can also find out more information. Okay. So for example, this is, these are some of the things that Submittable says about Denver Quarterly. So Denver Quarterly seeks to showcase exceptional work that's been translated into English. So they're talking, you know, they're accepting poetry and prose. They want, it sounds like they want really like innovative writing, experimental writing. And then they have the guidelines for the translation, right? And you want to make sure that you follow them and, you know, don't submit more than 4,000 words or submit the certain number of poems, et cetera. Um, and that translators are responsible for any copyright issues regarding like the original work. And translators can submit a translator's note, although you don't have to. And um, down at the bottom, I wanted to mention, it mentions simultaneous submissions. So simultaneous submissions means that, let's say you have one translation and you submit it to Denver Quarterly, you also submit it at the same time to, let's say, Granta. So that's a simultaneous submission. You have the same piece out simultaneously to different journals. Um, some journals don't allow that. Um, some, but I think that most do. And that just means that you're not having to wait a really long time to hear back about one piece before then sending it elsewhere. You can actually send it out to, you know, five or six places at once. And then whoever, you know, hopefully you hear back from one of them that you have, that, that your piece has been accepted. Uh, another thing to remember is if you do send out multiple pieces at once and you get an acceptance, immediately tell the other journals that it's been accepted elsewhere because they might be considering publishing your piece, they might be still reading it, and they really want to know if, it, if, it, if it's no longer available. Okay, see, we don't have a lot of time left. Okay, so while you're waiting, you've sent out your writing or your students have sent out their writing and you're waiting maybe a month, maybe you know more to hear back, just continue writing. So some of my students have already done a lot of writing and then some of my students want to write. They want to spend time doing creative writing. So that might be the case with you and your students too. So it's really important um, to have a, a writing community unless you're one of those people that you, you can be totally alone writing. You don't need encouragement. You don't need to have people around you as readers, et cetera. And there are some people like that. But if you're someone that would like to know other writers, like to have people that you can exchange your writing with and be part of that kind of community, I have some suggestions here. One is to connect with other writers on social media. Um, there, you know, if you, I think, do I have it on the next one? Yeah, so if, if you go to Twitter and you look up the hashtag writing community, you can find a lot of people on Twitter who are writing and, and who are connecting with other writers or aspiring writers or new writers and just talking about all these things related to writing. Um, you can take a writing class. You could participate in online writing challenges, teach a creative writing class or create a local writing group. So I'll talk a little bit more about these. So beyond um, you know, looking on Twitter at the writing community hashtag, I recommend getting a Twitter account just because there are a lot of writers on there. If you're anti-social media or you don't like Twitter, that's fine. That's, you know, I, I don't think that should accept, that should uh, affect whether or not you're gonna get uh, published, but it's just, it's nice because oftentimes people will, will tweet about a call for submissions or a new journal that's been started or some kind of writing contest. And it's a really easy way to get that information. Um, and also you can follow your favorite writers who are on Twitter and their favorite journals to learn more. 
Also, um, if you're on Twitter or you're on social media, it could be Facebook or whatever, and following these journals or writers, they will often post that they're going to be doing a free writer's talk or that they will be uh, doing a poetry reading online. And so these are some great ways for you to connect with these writers, to follow their work, to learn more about these journals, et cetera, and they're often free. Um, and also on Twitter, the account Literistic has a lot of, uh, they give a lot of information about upcoming submissions, journals, et cetera. So if you don't have a Duotrope account um, or you're not using like an online submission database like, uh, like the Submission Grinder, if you follow Literistic, you get to see a lot of things that they're posting. Also Submittable has a Twitter account. So if you follow Submittable, they also will post things that are upcoming. I think Duo, I imagine Duotrope probably does too. Another thing you can do is you could look for NaNoWriMo's in your country um, or create one. So that stands for National Novel Writing Month. And that is a month, um, I think it's November, but that might just be in the States. But I know they have international groups. And many people in your city or your town at the same time are committing to writing a novel in one month. So um, you, you know, there's, there's an online forum where you can post how many words you've written, where you can meet people, connect. You can, have the, you can make up these little um, get-togethers. Uh, in my, when I lived in Denver, Colorado, one month I joined this group and every day they would say, oh, we're meeting at this coffee shop, you know, tonight at seven and people would just get together, meet each other and sit there and write. Uh, and I think you wanted to, you, there's like a writing limit. You want to write like 50,000 words in the month or something like that. And it's just really, you know, I don't think most people think they're going to write an absolutely wonderful, perfect novel in one month, but you can write a draft. And it's just that idea of getting yourself started, getting yourself in that writing habit. And I think it's really fun. They have lots of great activities. If you register online in your country or your city and, um, if there's not if there's not a group there you could start one um they, they have the the website where you can just like post announcements about where people are meeting you could say things like poets meeting at this you know this public place or i'm looking for other fiction writers whatever and it's a great way to connect with people and for my polish participants <laughs> um the uh, Olga, to Olga Tokarczyk, who you know, won the Nobel Prize, has a foundation that she's set up. And I haven't found more information about whether this has started. I think maybe the pandemic kind of delayed things, but I, she is running a foundation, I think, out of Wrocław that will have writing classes and other writing groups for uh for, for aspiring writers. And she's especially focused on women writers and she's very interested in animal rights. So if that's your thing, definitely look her up. I have some of the links at the end of the webinar. Okay, another thing that you can do um, if you wanna take some online writing classes because writing classes can be so expensive. Um, Skillshare is I think it's free for 60 days. So you sign up for Skillshare. Skillshare has classes on tons of different things, but they have some creative writing classes. And you can take classes with some amazing writers that I know I normally would not be able to afford to take classes with. Um, but for example, in this image, the, the writer in the middle is Roxane Gay. She's a famous writer in the States and she is just really an advocate for new writers and really encourages, um, especially writers of color to, you know, sorry, that was my five minute warning, to, um, you know, believe in themselves and to write more and to, and to write really authentic pieces. So you can take a class with her. Another writer, Kathy Fish, she's amazing. She's a, she does micro fiction, flash fiction. She teaches a class on Skillshare. So, you know, you can get these classes for free if you do like the, the initial sign up for a few months. I don't know, I'm not on Skillshare, but that's just from what I learned from researching it online. Another free online course is through Wesleyan University on Coursera. They have this whole certificate uh, program for creative writing. So the, of course, Coursera is free and you can you know, you connect with so many different people taking this course around the world. You might be asked to share something that you've written and have people respond to it. So this is another way that you can take a writing class for free, meet people internationally, write in English, get feedback. And you know, depending on the other people in your group, you might connect with someone um, who wants to exchange writing with you beyond the course. So I recommend looking into that. 
And as far as writing communities, this, this is not a writing class, although Catapult does offer writing classes, but Catapult is a journal and I believe also a press. Um, they put out books also, and they have this, this new community called Don't Write Alone. And if you go to the Catapult site and the link that I have at the end, they have all this information about craft essays, they give writing prompts. So if you're teaching a creative writing class or you just want to ins insert some creative writing activities into your academic writing classes, they have lots of information there, lots of things you can have students read. Um, and as it says here, they have educational materials for teaching creative writing classes. So I think that is a great resource. And another really wonderful resource, and this is for you know, adult students, higher level students, is through the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa. They have this online um, MOOC pack. So sometimes they will run these free like Coursera courses or these really you know, huge online courses. And then when they finish them, they, they put all of this on their website so you can access all of it when the course is finished. So for each of these different categories, like creative not creative nonfiction, creative fiction, writing about inclusivity, writing about social issues, et cetera. Um, they have text you can read, videos to watch. They have discussion questions, podcasts, craft talks. And this is really, um, really good, really thorough, really detailed. They have amazing writers from all over the world. By following a few of these courses, I have learned about so many international writers writing in English or writing in translation that I'd never heard of before. So this is really, really strongly focused too on international writers. So definitely check this out. Okay, so just some last minute tips and reminders. Uh, make sure that you know what you're writing. Sometimes you might start, when you start out writing, you don't realize that what you're writing is experimental or what you're writing is actually called flash or that you're writing what could be called prose poetry and not just prose. So you can ask people who, um, you know, know more about writing genres, how they would assess your genre. And of course, by taking it, joining any of these online communities or these writing classes, people will often say, oh, that's a great micro piece or, oh, wow, I love that prose poem. And you might think, wow, I didn't realize I was writing prose poetry. Um, and then nowadays, I think, uh, at least it's more open that there's a lot more blending between the genres. So you could write something that's partly fiction, partly nonfiction, or you do a braided essay that braids a personal essay with a nonfiction essay about, you know, the history of your city, etc. cetera. Um, again, a reminder, don't pay to submit if you don't have to. There's a lot, there are a lot of free things out there that you can submit to without having to pay. Uh, again, I'll repeat my advice that, that I've heard, not necessarily followed, that you should apply to your dream journals, highest tier journals first, and then if, if they don't accept your work, then move on to the next tier. And make sure that you aren't sending your work out to a bunch of different journals if they don't accept simultaneous submissions. Keep track of your submissions. You can use you know, an Excel spreadsheet, or if you use Duotrope, it will keep track, or Submittable will keep track of your submissions, and make sure that you notify the other journals when you receive an acceptance. So here are, some of the, here are the sources, actually, and then in addition to the ones that I posted in the chat. So if you joined this webinar late, I posted a bunch of links about translation and where uh, you can find lists of journals that accept translation. Okay. Wow, I've, considering we started late, I am really happy that I got most of that in. So now that I have been talking nonstop, please let me know what are your questions, comments? Have any of you been submitting to journals? Do you have any journals you suggest? Uh, any questions about the process, et cetera? I'd love to hear from you because we have a really diverse audience here. And since we have a small group, if you want to unmute yourself and talk, you can, or type your question or comment in the chat. Everybody to, seems to be completely satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe overwhelmed by the amount of information I just shoved at everyone. <laughs> I just want to remind you again, too, that if you would like to get the links, you can email me. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn or you can email me at wbarnoski2015 at gmail.com and I can send you all the links from the webinar today. 
Um, and please, of course, always feel free to message me if you have, you know, if you know some journals that you recommend or you've gotten some things written and published, I always love to hear from participants in the webinars. Okay, so it looks like no one has any comments. Um, everybody, good luck with your writing and your students' writing. I hope you all have a wonderful summer, safe summer. And thank you again to those of you who have been attending the. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Somebody uh -huh. asked about uh, the slides, yes, whether they would be so. Uh, usually, Willow offered you to send an email to her and then she offered slides to you. Yes, that's the way it's worked so far. Yes, so send an email to, to Willow and or to me because I have the slides as well. So my my email address was pasted. And I hope I will we will be able to send you uh, the certificates through the system. But if it doesn't work, you have my email address and I will send them directly to you if if that doesn't work. Yes, but I will speak to Martin. We will see. <laughs> So Willow, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. And, and I, I would like to see some people saying that they're gonna submit their writing. That's wonderful. So take care everybody. It was wonderful chatting with you again. Thank you. And we will keep in touch, of course. Yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> I know something about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so goodbye everybody. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.